Thank you all so much for coming today. So a couple months ago when I put my talk up on the, on the website, I said, I'm gonna do data visualization field notes. And this is where I started and I just couldn't help myself. I got really excited about all of the topics and honestly the topic itself ballooned into something much bigger. And so I'm renaming my talk to data visualization retrospective because I think that will give you guys a much better sense of where we're gonna be going over the next 45 minutes. So I'm gonna be covering three main topics, abstractions, tools, and ecosystems. So these three topics are the ones that I wrestle with the most in my job today. These aren't things that I would say that I've mastered, but I think uh, what's missing is that they're not part of today's discussions in data visualization. I think part of why they're not is because to have nuanced discussions around these topics, we need to start building our vocabulary, a shared vocabulary so we can talk about them. So part of my goal today is to go through these three topics so we have at least the baseline for a shared vocabulary as we walk through them and discuss them more for the rest of the conference. So my name is Susie and I work at Netflix. I've worked there for about four and a half years and Shirley pointed out these are some of the libraries, D3 Legend and D3 Annotation that I've contributed back into the community. So this first topic is around data visualization design. I'm gonna be talking about the role of abstractions when you're designing data visualizations and the importance of landmarks between layers of abstraction. The next topic will go into data visualization tools. And we're discussing tools in terms of how they sit on a spectrum from a machine advantage to a human advantage. And this idea that right now, many of our tools are there for making data visualizations. But once you put visualization into a dashboard, you're also putting it into this scale of machine advantage to human advantage because you are trying to help optimize people for decision making. And in that case, the dashboard itself and the visualization piece itself also becomes a tool. And the third topic is one that's difficult to talk about, um, but I'm hoping I can shed some light on it, which is some of the important topics about data visualization in companies and why are they different. And so at a company, we're working with a system of dashboards there's a whole time component that usually isn't talked about with static visualizations, and there's a lot of user input. And all three of those things working together create a visualization ecosystem. Okay, abstractions. So when we're working with data visualizations, when we're creating them, we start off with data points. And we might think of all of these different ways to abstract our visualizations up to different layers. As we abstract up, it's easier for us to look at patterns and themes. As we go down, it's more about precision and nuance. So let's jump into an example. When I was a kid, I loved playing Pokemon. And so I played the original games that were on the Game Boy. And this is a guidebook, a strategy guide for that original game. <laughs> These are actual scans from my actual book from my childhood. And so you can see there's actual data visualization in here, right? At the, end of the, at the end of the book, you can see an individual Pokemon. You can see where they're found, some of the stats about it. And uh, on the right, you can see a data derivative something that's an aggregated version of these Pokemon. So each Pokemon can be either of one or two types. And this is, uh, and in the game you are a Pokemon trainer, you collect them and you battle with other Pokemon trainers and there's advantages and disadvantages between those types. And so this is a summary of those advantages and disadvantages by type. And so I thought it'd be fun, you know, now that I'm in data visualization to go back to this data set because it is quite rich to create a visualization. So the first thing that I tried was basically understanding how the types are related to one another. So this blue bubble represents Pokemon of just the water type. And then it's connected to Pokemon that are split between water and another type. So in this case, it then shows there's a relationship between water and fighting. And you can see there are certain types that are never directly connected to one another, the water type and the electric type. The next iteration was I'm gonna size these bubbles based off of the number of Pokemon that fall in each of these categories. 
But it wasn't until I got to this final iteration that really brings together something at the data point layer with something at an aggregate layer, the types, that it really allowed me to see some insights and it made it practical for me. For example, there's a Pokemon that is only of the grass type and there's only one Pokemon of that type. All other grass Pokemon are shared with other types or that there's no Pokemon that's of just the ghost type. So as I'm going up and down these different levels of abstraction, uh, I felt like it was key for me to understand allowing people to go between them effectively and that moment so that somebody can make a high level, uh, new, a high level um, understanding of the patterns and themes, but then relate it down to something that's more precise and nuanced. And I want to talk, to the, talk through this analogy with maps. So oftentimes, when we're thinking of going up levels of abstraction, right, uh, we're thinking of aggregating data. We might summarize something by a group or a dimension or an attribute of that data. And so in maps, if we're looking at something really zoomed in, here I'm focused on the pathways that are in this park, maybe looking at the boats. As I zoom out, right, I would say this is analogous to aggregating your data. You're zooming out higher level. Oftentimes, this is talked about as this 10,000 foot view of the data. But my concerns here are completely different. I'm looking at how this waterway cuts through all of these neighborhoods and the relationship of residential spaces to green spaces. I can't even really see that park I was originally at before. And I think there's been conversations in data visualization about this type of abstraction. But I want to introduce another type, which is visual abstraction. So this data, when I'm zoomed out this far, another way to abstract higher is also through the way that you're visually encoding that data. I would say that this map is more abstract than the satellite image map. It's reduced everything down basically to this waterway cutout and the land. But this isn't the view that we normally see when we go into Google Maps, right? We see this view. There are landmarks in this view that let you go from something that's high level to something that's low level. If I'm trying to find where my house is on this map, it gives me labels for some of the key intersections and some of those key landmarks to allow me to traverse between something that is very low level and specific and something high level. And so I want to raise these two types of abstraction. You're not only zooming, but you're also playing with fidelity. Another project that I did earlier this year was uh, with receipts. I took a grocery receipt that I had and I decided to remake it with data visualization. So here are the individual data points on that receipt. And there's a bar chart underneath each one just showing relative to the most expensive item on my receipt, how much this item stacked up. I wanted to also introduce a summary section at the top. And one iteration of that was just, again, grouping it by category. So in this case, meat and seafood was 30% of my receipt cost. But the final version, I decided to go one step further, abstract one step further, and go into a bubble chart. Part of the reason was because I wanted that summary to be visually distinct from the individual items below. I think the bar chart used in both cases actually makes it hard to distinguish the summary. But the other part of it was I really wanted to focus on rank. And you might naively say, oh, well, the bar chart is sorted by rank. That should be the best way to look at things by rank. But you're also visually encoding many things here that say it's actually of equal weight of all of the other items that are on the list, right? You're giving the same visual height to each of these items, which kind of also infers that they're the same. Each item is treated the same. They each have a bar chart. They each have an icon. They each have a label. And so in the final version, this allows you to see tiers of information, right? That bubble chart, not all things have icons. Only the biggest items have icons. And only the medium to large items have labels for the actual percentages themselves. So I would argue this is a more abstract version, even though it's at that same summary level. And its goal was to emphasize rank even more. 
So if we put this in the context of the map analogy, I would say from the visual items to the summary, we're zooming out, and then from the bar chart to the bubble map, we're abstracting visually. And in this case, these icons and labels are my landmarks. I also want to put in this observation of, I think, the farther away you get from the data points, the more landmarks you should leave to find your way back. Because again, this is what we see in Google Maps. It would be really hard for us to understand the details if we abstracted this too far. It would be difficult to understand where we are necessarily in relation to other things. And this would be potentially going too far in that abstraction without leaving those tiers, those landmarks to get your way back. Another way to think about like why would we ever even abstract at all is thinking about code abstractions. Why do we do code abstractions? It makes complex tasks seem simpler. And it also allows you to concentrate on issues at different levels. And I would say this is equally true for data visualization abstractions. This is also what we are trying to do when we're abstracting different layers of data into different data derivatives. And so back to this chart, as we're going up, it's patterns and themes. And from that, we're learning by separating concerns. And as we go down, we're learning precision and nuance through example. The next topic is data visualization tools. So this is what I would consider a tool. This package that I worked on helps you automatically generate a legend based off of scales you've already used in your visualization process. This is to help create annotations in D3. And oftentimes, I think of these tools on this spectrum from human advantage to machine advantage, right? We're trying to optimize as much as we can, push as much as we can to the machine advantage while still optimizing for a person to be able to come in and interact with this system, to interact with this tool. So here's an example of some types of machine advantages and human advantages. So for example, drawing a map projection. That's something that's extremely precise, difficult to do, something great to go and pitch over to a computer to work on. But things like storytelling, gestalt principles, working with your intuition, those are all human advantages that we bring to the table. And here I've just laid in some examples of tools that are across this entire spectrum, right? Even on the human advantage side, we have tools such as Sketch and Figma to help us understand, uh, to help us make those decisions more. But it's leaving much more of the decisions in the person's hands. And I think that we've done a great job in data visualization in pushing many things over to that human advantage. And what I'm most interested in today is understanding this gray area in between. Let's jump into an example. So the entire time I've been in data visualization, everybody has said, color is hard. Color is hard. Color is hard, right? And there have been so many different tools that have come out to try and tackle different parts of this problem. I worked on one myself called Biz Palette. Worked on it with Elijah Meeks. It's a way for you to drop in a list of colors, see them on different chart types, and then you can also see a color report that helps you identify naming conflicts, color conflicts, and also simulate different color deficiencies. So in this case, I would say Viz Palette does put some things on the machine advantage side, such as showing colors in use, exporting for code, and it leaves much of it to the human advantage side. You're coming to it and you are the one that's deciding what colors to pick. You're deciding how to edit those colors and what palette size you want. There's another project called Color Goracle, which actually puts many of these decisions and pushes them over to the machine advantage side. You basically just need to put in the number of colors that you want, and you get a list of potential categorical colors for your use case. So if I put these in comparison, I would say Viz Palette skews more towards the human advantage side, and Color Goracle skews more towards that machine advantage. I think not unless we actually try pushing different aspects, features, 
parts of these problems over to the machine advantage side, will we actually learn and be able to build our intuition and better solutions in this gray area and potentially move some of them over to the machine advantage or human advantage? And then this final piece is all of these tools that we've talked about so far are about creating data visualizations. But once you put data visualization into a dashboard, that then in itself is a tool that is also on this scale. So an example from work. So I worked on this annotation library when it first came out, and I thought, oh, this is so great. I'm gonna start adding annotations in everywhere on all of my dashboards at work, and it's gonna be this huge success, right? I embarked on this project where we would see anomalies like this. So for example, imagine this is signups over time by location, and you'd see this anomaly, and you're like, oh, that's because we had a promotion in Hawkins on, the, on July 4th. That's what this spike in signups is. And as a person, if you were to see another spike that was on that same day, you would think, oh, they're probably related to one another. How are they related? Oh, it's because in Hawkins, you know, a lot of people use walkie-talkies, and now we're seeing that also in the device anomaly. And so I thought, okay, well, people are, in, people are slicing and dicing our data in all of these ways, and I'm gonna build them a tool where we use anomaly detection, and they can basically group all of these anomalies together and say all of these anomalies at different levels at different cuts are associated with the same annotation. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be revolutionary. So the machine advantage side is finding the anomalies. The human advantage side is grouping and tagging those anomalies. And then we're exposing those in dashboards so that people that don't necessarily know about this context would have it shared and shown to them. But this ended up being actually a huge failure. I mean, this product is no longer in use at Netflix because this data gets reloaded quite often. Um, when we talk about signups, there's a lot of fraud detection that happens, which causes us to clean up that data and asking people to continuously re-tag potential anomalies that they had already tagged simply because the data was reloaded was a huge blocker where it just made that task really monotonous um, and repetitive. And so it wasn't, this solution wasn't well positioned to optimize for that human advantage side. It didn't push enough over to the machine. But that's not to say that I don't think this is a valid place for us to be innovating. I actually think it's one of the best places for us to be innovating because I learned so much from that experience. And we're not going to learn from that experience unless we try and push solutions that live here. All right, this last topic, data visualization ecosystems. So when I first came into data visualization, it was really dominated by data visualization in journalism. And so my expectations were I was just going to come into Netflix and make something that was like one of these, this is a climate change piece um, by The Guardian. And so it would just be basically translating these best practices over into a product world, over into a company. But that's not true. I mean, there are many factors about data visualization at a company that are very different from the examples that I had been exposed to prior to working at Netflix. And I would say it's very difficult to actually make those topics public and talk about them. And so much of my data visualization work is not public, right? But I'm hoping, at least beginning to talk about some of these topics, we can have ways that we can still learn from those experiences. And so this final part, data visualization in companies, is talking about how all of these additional dimensions come together to create an ecosystem. Two of the biggest factors that are at play are actually time. Over time, these dashboards are being used. But over time, our meaning evolves and our intuition evolves. And this is constantly affecting how somebody is reading a dashboard or what they get away from it or, or take away from it. It's also really, really user driven. We have people that are using our dashboards and they're generating hypotheses, testing hypotheses. And these changes can come back as a feedback loop into the dashboards themselves in terms of what are we measuring? What are we interested in? And all of this, all of this in concert 
is just for us to understand this very ambiguous question. Is Netflix doing well? In what ways and how could it be doing better? So let's dig into this axis of time. If a new title launches, right, we have people that are in the content world that will say, oh my gosh, this is the title that I've been working on for the last six months. How is it doing? I'm going to check it today. I'm going to check it tomorrow. I'm going to check it the day after. How did it do relative to our initial estimate, our initial estimates and our secondary estimates and to all of these comparison lines that we have on here? And maybe three years ago, this was an original title that did extremely well, and these numbers were amazing. It shot everything else out of the water. But today, it's near the bottom of the pack, and that's an example of that context and meaning also changing. And so as we're working with these dashboards, as we're working with this living system, our understanding of meaning evolves. The next is that user-driven piece. So back to journalistic data visualization, typically you have a linear story that's being told. Whereas with the dashboards that we're building, we want to allow our users to come in and create their own branching narrative. And what I like about this analogy is that it doesn't take away the storytelling piece. It's just a different kind of story. Allowing people to do that, allowing people to create their own branching narrative, then leads them to generate hypotheses about how the system is currently performing, the things that we see in it, but also allow them to generate hypotheses about ways to change that system. And then that feeds back in through testing. So let's walk through an example in product. In product, we're often interested in how the Netflix homepage is performing. So here's an example of a row that may or may not be a real row on Netflix. And say we're interested in evaluating how it's doing. One of the first questions I might ask might be, on average, where is this row being placed over time? You know, maybe a couple months ago it was near the top of the page, and now it's, you know, seven ranks lower. And what happened here? And you know. Taking this back to the different levels of abstraction from the beginning of the talk, maybe we layer on another data derivative here, in this case, a heat map to help us understand volume. So the darker areas then show us, this is when this row was actually shown to a lot of people. And so the change in rank is really a side effect of the fact that we decided to show this row to way fewer people. Maybe as part of that investigation, I'm wondering, well, what are the actual titles that show up in that row? Let me dig into that mix. Has that changed? Or maybe is there a specific title whose performance used to really add to this row and now is gone? And I'm jumping between these different dashboards, these different levels of abstraction, trying to understand what is going on. Maybe I want to understand how people are actually behaving within the UI itself. As I look at this, I can see that 35% of the people, of all people that saw this on their homepage, interacted with this row. And then 100% of them ended up playing something. But that was six months ago. What about now? Last week, only 10% of people interacted with that row, and way fewer of them interacted with it. And so it's not only about looking at these different different cuts, different abstractions of the data. It's also about understanding how these systems and snapshots of them change over time. And so in this last example, I jumped through many different dashboards that we have at Netflix. None of these dashboards are isolated or siloed in terms of the context that they bring to our users. They all know, they, you know each user is using multiple dashboards every day. We even have this dashboard of dashboards to try and understand how this is happening, right? So I masked the data here, and we're going to imagine that these LaCroix flavors are actually different dashboards at Netflix. And we're going to zoom into this melon grapefruit dashboard, which is the third most consumed one that we have. 
And you might look at this across different departments to understand what department it's most relevant for. In this case, we can see it's relevant to 46% of the Corgi department, which is a lower percentage than the pugs. Or you might actually go in and say, well, of the people that use or consume melon grapefruit, how many are consuming any of these other dashboards? 75% of them are also consuming lime. And so again, this is just to reinforce this idea. All of these dashboards are living in a system. It's this constantly evolving system. And just a reminder, again, all of this is just trying to understand this one ambiguous question. Is Netflix doing well? So how does this pertain to all of you who might not be in a product company? You might be in journalism, you might be in academia. Well, when I first came to data visualization, there were so many topics that we learned from journalism. And I'm hoping that we can think about how are some of the lessons that we're learning from visualization at companies uh, and see how we can apply them to other data visualization domains. So if we think about the topic of climate change, this is a static data visualization, linear storytelling. Imagine if this article actually sat in an ecosystem of articles about this topic with user input that allowed you to change or potentially propose new metrics in terms of evaluating this system. What could that potentially do, right? All right, so I just want to recap these three topics. We first talked about abstractions and the roles of them and the importance of building landmarks and then data visualization tools from this machine advantage to human advantage and then this ecosystem of dashboards that are affected both by time and user input. And that's not to say that these topics aren't interchangeable. There's a lot of crossover for each one of these for them to be successful. You need to be able to allow people to go up the levels of abstraction in the tools, in the dashboards, in the ecosystem, across different dashboards. And I wanna leave you with these three final notes about each of these sections. I hope that after this talk, when you're creating visualizations, you start thinking about, am I designing them with effective abstractions? Am I leaving landmarks for people as they come to them to go up and down these levels? What innovative ways can we all innovate in this gray area between human advantage and machine advantage? And finally, what can we learn from visualization ecosystems and how can we apply that into other data visualization domains? Thank you.